Uh, good morning, everyone. I will uh, not try to do this in Estonian. Uh, and you should be happy for that, I think. Uh, I understand. I understood what you said, but I would not try to talk it myself. I would like to th say thank you for inviting me and uh, also for hosting an excellent dinner last night. Very nice. Uh, so I can see that there has been a, taken a toll on some people here because it's not as full as it was yesterday. So. Let's see then. Here we go. It's always nice to be first. Okay, seems to work. Um, I am supposed to talk about key factors. for successful mineral exploration in Sweden. And I said to my boss, this will be a very, very quick talk. Because uh, uh, if we have had successful uh, exploration or not, it's a matter of debate. Um, I think it's still a fairly good thing to be able to talk here, because we had a discussion over breakfast that Estonian is well known for the ability to learn from others' mistakes. So you should pay attention, I think. Uh, there's a fair amount of things you could learn here, I think. So I, uh, I could start by saying this. So the first basic thing for having successful exploration is, of course, geology. Otherwise, it would be very difficult. Uh, you, can see, you can see the outline of Sweden here. Uh, you should be. It's a very fine gray map, but it disappeared a little bit. But the main thing remains. Uh, you can see that there's, there has been a lot of historical mining in Sweden, over 3,000 mines for the past 1,000 years. So the geology is definitely there. Uh, those 3,000 mines are not around anymore. They are not active, of course. And as you can see, Sweden is known as an iron mining country, and it's pretty evident why. Most of these mines have been iron mines. If you look a little bit more at the recent history, uh, this is what it looks like the past 100 years. And you can see it even in, uh, even in uh, the early 1900s, there were 250, almost 300 mines in Sweden. But then things happened. So there's been a steady decline. This is exactly like happened in most of the world. That's where you had to, to have better, better uh, resources if you wanted to succeed in mining. So the smaller ones went, went bankrupt, and uh, the number of mines just kept declining. And I put in uh, the year 1992 here, because up until that, Sweden was effectively almost closed to um, international companies. Uh, 1992, two things happened. Uh, both of them connected with the European Union. And because Sweden adopted to the EU legislation, which made it necessary or made it possible, depending on who you ask, to open up for international exploration. So that happened here. And uh, you really can't see any effect on the number of mines, at least. And I'll be coming back to that. What immediately happened uh, is that this is the exploration expenditure, uh, which had been fairly steady, uh, around 150 million Swedish crowns, and even declining a little bit. Uh, blue and green are state-financed, and the red is privately owned, uh, essentially bullied. And plus uh, some of the very minor companies, but it was uh, essentially one mining company. What happened in 92 is that we started getting a lot of, lot of exploration uh, increased in Sweden. Uh, so it definitely had an effect. We got aboard a lot of exploration companies. Uh, this was a genuine boom. And you can also see that in uh, the area <coughs> of mining or exploration licenses, I'm sorry. Uh, 
which went up a couple of years afterwards when uh, the Swedish mining inspectorate started to was able to uh, handle all the applications. So it went up and peaked around uh, one million hectares uh, of exploration licenses in uh, approximately 10 years ago, and then it's been on a decline, so it's, it's somewhere steady around uh, four or five hundred thousand hectares a year now, which is much, much higher than it was before 92. So if you take a look at the, look at the global situation, uh, again, you can't see the map, but you can see a map anyway, you can imagine it. <laughs> uh, so you can see that of the total expenditure, uh, less than 2% is spent in Sweden and Finland combined. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not very much. So we are really, in the global scale, uh, minor actors. But in a European scale, uh, there are not many players around. So it's essentially Sweden, Finland, plus a couple of others around. So for e EU, for Europe, I think we're fairly important. Going back to the recent history, you can see that uh, there has something has definitely happened when it comes to... Um, sorry, wrong. When it comes to... Uh, Tonnage mind, they have incredible, incredible development from, say, four or five million tons a year in the early 1900s, and it has peaked now around uh, 75, 80 million tons a year. It's uh, this is quite remarkable, and this is what is what the mining boom is. It is not an increased number of mines; it's an increased efficiency. A few mines doing much, much more mining. And actually, one, it's one mine which is responsible, or we can thank for much of this, and that's Aitik mine in northern Sweden. Uh, porphyry type of copper, which produces now 36 million tons a year. So it's a so substantial part of uh, the Swedish mining when it comes to tonnage. Looking at the situation today, we have approximately 15 active mines, uh, which metal mines, I'm, I'm not talking about industrial minerals or others, but metal mines, 15. And um, there is there's something pretty interesting with that, because more than 95% of the ore mined in 2007 was, comes from mines older than 50 years. Mines between 50 and 800 years old. So, the recent mines does not contribute to very much in the form of tonnage, at least. And you can also see that still iron ores are pretty important. Uh, they are, it's, uh, Sweden is divided into three parts when it comes to mining. It's uh, Norbot, the Nord district, uh, dominated by iron ores. It's the Schleftor district dominated by base metals and the uh, Vadislagen district also base metals nowadays. Another important figure is when it comes to talking about working places, opportunities. Uh, this is for politicians, of course, rather important, uh, and also for society as a whole, of course. You can see that up to 92, there was a steady decline in the number of working places, which is blue, and the number of uh, employees here. And this is when I started studying geology. I had a professor who told me in the early, late, 80, late 80s, 89, that I should forget about mining and exploration because it was soon about to be dead in Europe. There would be zero mines in uh, Northern Europe, or perhaps one mine could survive, but no more than that, so it was dead-end business. This was 89. 1990, he had so much to do himself with exploration that he went on leave from, his, from the office. So something really changed in the eight, late 80s, early 90s. And you can actually see something starting to change here as well, even if the reaction came a little bit afterwards. Uh, you can see that the number of employees has gone up uh, and it's, it's a significant increase. And this, of course, 
depends on the fact that uh, the tonnage has increased a lot. It's, uh, even if you have a strongly increased efficiency, you need more working force to be able to do that. So why Sweden? And it's, I think it's the same, re I will, I will say, I'm saying things that I think are my Finnish colleagues are going to say about Finland as well, because they are very similar in that matter. Uh, we have the geology, as you saw, uh, the, the good uh, data quality, which Professor Hitch talked about yesterday. I'm not sure if he's in the public, but in the audience, but um, uh, that is, of course, extremely important if you want to attract foreign investments. Uh, we have an uh, excellent infrastructure. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to find an area in Sweden if you exclude the mining district or uh, the, the mountain district where uh, you don't have a road very close by. And uh, that is very convenient for, for instance, for uh, Canadians or Australians who are used to having no roads anywhere near anything. So they find it very convenient. And also we have the power lines uh, almost all over the country. Uh, we have a very well-known mining cluster. You should not neglect that. Uh, most of you know about Epiroc and uh, also Sandvik and uh, some other players. And this contributes strongly to the, to the reputation of the Swedish mining cluster and uh, Sweden as a mining country. We have existing mines, of course. If you have that, it shows that you can do mining in a country. Skilled working force, I just show you that they have increased the number of employees. Uh, a pr uh, getting an exploration permit is not too difficult. It's a very quick process. It's very efficient at the mining inspectorate, but the problems comes after that. I'll talk about that. And we have high environmental standards, uh, which actually is attractive for mining companies today. Uh, there's, there's a misconception uh, even in Sweden, that mining companies are, don't care about the environment, that is not correct anymore. They, they do not survive if they have that attitude. So what do they do? It's, it's uh, basically it's a very simple process when you want to do exploration, in Sweden at least. It's a question of finding funding, which is nowadays not so easy because a lot of, pe lot of money goes into marijuana. In, Canada and the US, which is actually a problem for the exploration sector. So it's a, it's a bit odd to be, to be sidetracked by marijuana, but that is what is happening. Uh, but if you happen to find the money, uh, finding a free prospective ground is the next step, and then increasing the increasingly uh, important is you need to uh, find and develop social acceptance. Uh, this I would not have written 10, 15 years ago. Today it's crucial. And of course you need to go very strictly by the law, otherwise you'll run into problems. A lot of people keep an e eager eye on you doing something which deviates from the law and then you get problems. So what you tend to do is first you tend to contact the mining inspectorate to get the legal framework right. You get some advice from us as well but, uh, from the geological survey, but going straight to the mining inspectorate is a good idea to ask how it works, what they want. Uh, it's good always to get personally in touch and not just trust what you read on the internet. You should always talk to them and ask questions. So once you find out what the, what the legal framework is, it's uh, the next step is to find the geological information. I'm sorry for the typo, which should be geological, not geological. So, uh, before someone says you misspell it, I thought I'd better say it that first. So it's a question of doing that and uh, that's essentially done. We have a one shop stop, uh, one stop shop, uh, it's called Mineral Information Office in Northern Sweden where you can acquire almost all geological data related to exploration and mining. Together with advice. You can sit down with the people there and talk to what you want to do and what you're looking for before you hand in your exploration permits. This was, ex this was established 1992 and you understand why. And it's one of the first types of, it, one of the first of its kind in the world and uh, it actually contributed to Sweden getting a very good reputation as an exploration and mining friendly country. Which actually made us top the Fraser Institute list for a couple of years. 
we have been sliding down that list, replaced by some other strange country called Finland, I think. But it's nice to have good neighbors. So that is what you what you tend to do then is when you establish yourself, you immediately find uh, legal support so you don't do any legal errors because that will get you into problems. As I said, you have a lot of people watching out exactly all everything you do as an exploration company in Sweden. And you need to fire consultants with people skills. If you don't know the language, find someone who does and who, who understands how it works and who, underst who understands that it's different to work in northern Sweden and southern Sweden. You need, to, you need to understand that, so you need to hire local people. So if you follow that typical process, will you succeed? Uh, in Sweden, no, nay means no. So, um, you see a lot of no or nay on this one, and this is uh, something like 10 or 12 uh, good projects running into problems uh, for the last seven or eight years, uh, stranded somewhere in some legal issue at the moment, which is of course a problem. And also uh, other things are happening. A uh, large chunk of the Archean crust we have in northern Sweden is off limits due to uh, S-range, uh, the space center in Sweden, which says it's impossible to do exploration and mining in that area, even if it works in other parts of the world. In Sweden it's impossible, which is interesting. But So that was a no. Uh, uranium exploration and mining is no more allowed in Sweden since last summer, despite our own environmental protection agency saying that it makes no sense to say no to uranium exploration and mining. Uh, the Parliament still made it illegal. No one will. Well, I understand why, but it's a bit strange. And uh, now we have a, sec a third thing coming up. Uh, we have uh, the new go Parliament wants, um, or the new government wants us to uh, see how we can make it difficult to do exploration and mining in alum shales, which is something you should pay attention to in Estonia, really. Because in my view this is a bit tricky, because uh, this is a type of rock where you find a lot of critical metals. Uh, so saying no to exploration and mining in it is, it, it will actually be a bit of a problem. It doesn't say it should be prohibited or it should be banned, but it should be made much more difficult, which is a bit of a problem because the, uh, the environmental standards in Sweden are, maxim are at maximum force. So if you try to make them, make them even more difficult, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't see how that is supposed to be done, but we'll have to see about that. But there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, there is at least one... Uh, one uh, or two projects that seems to be able to go all the way, but they are rather small. And why is this? I think we heard a little bit about this yesterday. Uh, up until approximately 10 years ago, uh, mining and exp mining, the mining business in Sweden was seen as the uh, new Klondike, it should, it should make Sweden rich again. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Not that Sweden has ever been very poor, but it was seen as a to great success, then all of a sudden things came crushing down. Uh, and I think there we, we touched upon some important parts yesterday, but uh, the Natura 2000, the effects of that uh, became evident 10 years ago that uh, this was said to be a sort of mild protection area, but turned out that it's viewed almost as a national park in the public eye, and it's much more regulated than it was supposed to be. And also the Water Framework Directive has caused a lot of problems. And on top of that, we got some social media, none mentioned and none forgotten, which makes it extremely easy to uh, uh, gather activists against mining. It's, it's uh, unbelievably easy nowadays. You can, you can do it yourself in five minutes if you feel like it. Not that I encourage you, but I just shout. It's, it's so easy. So this caused a lot of problems. Um, and where are we heading? Well, you all know about battery metals. Uh, it's a great concern. Uh, if you want to make a transition to green economy, 
we need to do mining. It's, uh, it's pretty evident. We have some very nice uh, projects uh, dealing with that type of uh, elements in Sweden. This is Bouliden, which project they can have a maximum ore production of 54 million tons a year in a lobber, uh, which is substantial. Uh, also, we have an excellent rare earth deposit driven by leading edge materials, which, has, which is stranded somewhere in the legal system. This is, has not stranded yet, but let's see. Uh, it's uh, Talga resource in northern Sweden doing some interesting, having some interesting prospects on uh, graphite and uh, also cobalt, uh, copper uh, gold. And also in southern Sweden, a very recent one, vanadium uh, exploration. They think they have a target of uh, between 610 to 1.2, 610 million to 1.2 billion tons. Uh, so it's substantial, but this has caused a lot of debate in the Swedish press. So, if we want to make a transition to a green tra energy transition, we need to do this, and it's up to ourselves. If we want to do mining at home or out of sight, Remember that environment is not the same thing as, in, as climate. This is a clear case when uh, you, mining does affect the local environment, but it's, it's needed if we want to make sure that we limit our carbon dioxide emissions. There's no question about it. So they, they crash, they clash here. And as a final word, I thought a little bit about is there a link between Sweden, Estonia and metals? And I actually found one in a bookstore in, here in Tallinn. Uh, Pivi Bixup. Uh, come to think of it, she is heavily dependent on access to gold. Without a lot of gold coins in her chest, she would probably not be as uh, relaxed and uh, well off as she is. So I know she's popular in Estonia. This is the closest link I got to. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kai. Definitely everyone in this room hope that you have some uh, special, special recipe how to deal with this uh, social uh, acceptance. But uh, as we heard, it's hard in Sweden too. I think it's hard everywhere. It's, mm. uh, but on the positive side, I, I, th I see more and more articles, news articles on decision makers and even uh, activists saying that, okay, we realize that we need mining to do this, but not here. Mm -hmm. uh, Nimbi or banana. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the banana concept. We heard it yesterday. B build absolutely through. nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a more severe form of Nimbi. Uh, so we, we still see that, but um, we see, see signs that decision makers and uh, activists are starting to realize that mm. we need to do this. So that's on the positive side. Mm. Do you have any good examples when you... I think uh, some of the, the later ones who have come, come to Sweden has adopted to the system and really taking social acceptance seriously. That, that is the first thing they do. Uh, the bad thing is that it only takes one bad apple and mm. the whole sector gets tainted. That's a, that's a problem because we have those as well. So I think it's a question for the industry itself to look after it, uh, their members and their companies. Very good. Kas soovib küsida veel midagi? Üheks küsimuseks oleks hetkel aega. Lihtsalt tuleb anda käega märku ja... Ja ei soovi. Ah, ikkagi, paga tore. Aitäh, panun sinna keskele saan anda kohe. Thank you for the presentation. It was a really good review or insight to the Swedish development. Um, actually, I, I got interested in regards of in the 90s where the uh, outsize, uh, outside um, money started to pour in from Australia and Canada. Um, I, I'm just interested about the changes that uh, not just the money uh, changed, but uh, these uh, external companies coming in for exploration. How much? it's changed uh, Sweden exploration and mining industry per se. Uh, that's a very good 
it's, it's a very good question because I should have said that. It changed the exploration, of course. It made, uh, until 92, we had essentially just two, one state owned, that's LKAB, the iron mining, and then Booliden, a uh, large mining producer. Uh, it made them become much more aware of they needed to step up their exploration. Uh, that, that is one effect, because they got uh, competi competition. But since uh, they have been unsuccessful, unsuccessful in opening mines, we still have a, a very small, uh, it's essentially dominated by those two companies still in Sweden. We have a very few junior or other companies around. Uh, so it's, it's still a different place than Finland is, which have a larger, uh, more complex composition of mining companies, I'd say. Aitäh, aitäh kai.